Dr. Seuss, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch that lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask me why, for no one knows quite the reason. It could be that his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think the most likely reason of all, and don't miss this church, may have been that his heart is two sizes too small. We're starting a brand new series called Dr. Seuss, How the Grinch Sold Christmas. And whether you're a fan of the classic book by Dr. Seuss, I'm a huge Dr. Seuss fan. Whether you remember the cartoon from the 60s growing up, that's the one that I watched. And uh, a few years ago, Jim Carrey remade it into a, a movie with Ron Howard. So no matter where you're at, I think we're all familiar with that, that Christmas story and the, the problem the Grinch had. And, and it's really a classic Christmas tale, isn't it? Someone who, um, there's Christmas spirit, there's Christmas cheer, and there's those who kind of don't like that and want to fight against that. And, and as Dr. Seuss says here, the problem with the Grinch is his heart. His heart was too small. And, and Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything we are, every relationship we're in, every decision we make has everything to do with our heart. That's what the Bible just said. Everything we do flows from it. And I would contend, just like Dr. Seuss's Grinch, if we aren't careful, our hearts could be the problem. And not just with Christmas spirit, although that's part of it, but I think our hearts could be the problem throughout the rest of the season as well. There was an article that I read that kind of caught my eye um, being uh, talking about this series, and it talked about how sometimes we can have a Grinch-like attitude toward Christmas. And maybe you know somebody who maybe right now has a Grinch-like attitude toward Christmas. If they're sitting next to you, do not elbow them, okay? But, so, this is what this article said. There's five symptoms of a Grinch-like heart on Christmas. And, and I just wanted to point these out because I thought these were very fitting to what we were talking about here. The first one is a pessimistic attitude toward Christmas. Like, oh, I just, I can't stand Christmas right now. I, I've heard people say this, I think Christmas has gotten way too commercial and, and all of the stuff and man, all the music and those types of things. Maybe somebody's been pessimistic towards Christmas. The second thing the article said was procrastinate decorations, right? It's a lot of work to put up Christmas decorations. I remember being a kid, I used to love to enjoy driving around and looking at the lights. When you're an adult, guess what? You have to do all the work to make that happen. It it's kind of takes away some of the fun sometimes, right? And put up the tree and, and all the things as well. Here's the third one the article said. Sometimes we just go through the motions. Sometimes we feel like we're just obligated to, to wake up and, and maybe go visit family or those types of things, but there's really no joy in it. We're just feeling like we're kind of going through the motions. Of Christmas. The fourth one it said is to withdraw from others. Again, this time can be a very joyful time, but it can also be a very lonely time. I'm more concerned about Christmas this year probably than years past because of what we've just been through this year and all of the social distancing that we've had and people are already feeling lonely and isolated and, and now Christmas can come along and really even amplify that feeling as well. But the last one was really I felt the most telling. If you have a, a Grinch-like spirit of Christmas. It says, if you feel relief when it's over, <laughs> when you go, oh, thank God we got through Christmas and now we can move forward. Is that your heart towards Christmas? Or, or, do you ever feel any of those things? Maybe one or a few? Well, I just want to let you know, church, I wish Christmas was all year long. <laughs> I love Christmas. Christmas has never been a season for me. And, and I would say Christmas was never intended to be a season that we celebrate. It's supposed to be a point of transformation. And I think when we really understand Christmas, it won't just be a season we celebrate. It'll be Christmas 365 days a year. And like I said, we're going to look at this series. And the Christmas narrative is very familiar to most of us. But this series, we're going to look at it a little differently. Instead of looking at the main characters, the Mary, the Joseph, the shepherds, all of those, we're going to take some time to unpack what I consider are the Grinches of the first Christmas. There were Grinches at the first Christmas. And to kick it off, by way of introduction, we're going to look at the most Grinchiest Grinch of all Grinches for the first Christmas. That's right, the guy by the name of King Herod. Now, if you're not familiar with the, with the Bible or with history, King Herod was the king of Judea when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 
We read about it in Matthew chapter 2. And if you've got your Bibles, you want to go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 2. But one of the things that I find really interesting about King Herod, and this is uh, a point for throughout Scripture, is that this is not just some made-up person. Herod the Great was an actual person who actually lived in history. And who actually, we can read about other things in history that happened with Herod the Great. And the reason why he was called Herod the Great is because he accomplished a lot of things. He ruled in the area of Judea. His father was actually a friend of Julius Caesar, one of the most famous Caesars in Rome. And Julius Caesar helped uh, Herod rise to power. He did some amazing things. He was also called Herod the Builder. One of the things that Herod did was he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem and restored it to former glory. He also built a, a palace called Masada, which if you go over to Israel today, you can actually visit the palace that Herod made at Masada. It's one of the greatest archaeological finds of our time. And the fact that it's still there 2,000 years later means a guy knew what he was doing. And he, uh, he brought about peace in the area. But it, the interesting thing about Herod the Great is that his peace was not really uh, what we would consider peaceful. He was very cruel. He was very self-centered. A couple of things that he did throughout history is one of the things he did was right after he took office, he had the entire Jewish Sanhedrin, 70 of the most influential Jewish leaders, had them all put to death. Okay? Not exactly a great way to start. <laughs> uh, then he had his two eldest sons killed, along with his favorite wife, because he saw them as a threat to the throne. Then he turned around and had his wife's brother, mother, and uncle all killed. Now, if you're having some relatives come over for Christmas, I don't suggest this, okay? This is not the way you deal with family drama, but apparently Herod the Great, that was what he decided to do, was he's just gonna, gonna wipe them all off. And, and why do I tell you all that stuff? Because here's what I think we forget. When we hear all about Herod and, and the things that he did, sometimes we forget that Herod was actually a human being. He actually was born to parents. And at one point, he was a little child. And what happened in him? What, what made Herod get to the point that his, just like the Grinch, his heart was two sizes too small? And he would act that way in such a horrible way to his own family. And so I've got a little picture that I want to show you just to kind of point this out. So uh, a picture that I want you to see. We'll put it up here on the screen. Yeah. Look at that little kid. Isn't that a cute little kid? Right? You're like, oh, look at the little baby, you know? And you see this little guy, you're like, oh, that'd be really cool to see him. But what if I told you that this is actually a picture of uh, uh, Adolf Hitler when he was a little baby? Now, when, when you think of Hitler, right, we think of the guy with the mustache and the harm and the, and the uniform and all of the horrible things he did. We don't think about him like this, do we? And I bring you back to the question, think about Herod. What, what is that about someone that would take him from this innocent little precious thing and turn him into a mass murderer? And an awful thing. And I would contend just what the Bible said back in Proverbs 4. Everything flows from our heart. What causes the heart to shrink? How, how do we get to a place where we do that? And I would say this. Heart disease is the number one cause of death today. Your heart, no matter what, uh, for the last several years, heart disease has been the number one cause of death. But I would say, I don't think it's just our physical death. I think heart disease is something we suffer from emotionally. And spiritually as well. And I would contend it causes the death of those things as well. So if you got your note sheet, I want you to go ahead and take them out. On the back side, it's blank. There's a reason for that. We want you to write these things down so you can have them. But I'm going to give you three heart conditions that we're going to avoid. And we're going to look at the life of Herod and the narrative of the Christmas narrative and walking through this to understand why Herod's heart was where it was at, what the heart conditions he had, and how you and I can avoid it. So the first condition that Herod had was Herod had a disturbed heart. Herod had a disturbed heart. That was the first condition that he had in his heart. Going back to Matthew 2 in the first verse, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and have come to worship him. Now, a couple of things about the Magi. And these, again, kind of famous characters in the, um, the Christmas narrative we've talked about before. Um, tradition says that there were how many wise men? 
Three, right? Okay, now we know that that's not true. That what they did is they brought three gifts, gold, Frankenstein, and myrrh, myrrh right, right? Frankenstein's and myrrh. <laughs> so that's the three gifts they brought. They, didn't, they also did not smoke a rubber cigar. Right, that's not in there, okay, if you're, you're, you're from me. But uh, so that's one thing. There was a big caravan. It wasn't just three of them that came. It was a huge group. And it says they came from the east. Now, this is important to understand while, while we're talking about Herod and where we're going with this. Matthew was writing his gospel about Jesus, the story of Jesus, to a group of Jewish people. Matthew was a Jew. And Matthew wanted to help his Jewish brothers and sisters, his family, understand that the Messiah had come. So when he put this in, and he said this story of the Magi coming from the East, this is what that happened. And most scholars have agreed on this as well. If you remember 400 years before this happened, the Jews were in exile. They had a period of 70 years where they were conquered in Jerusalem. They had to be taken to Babylon, and they lived in Babylon 70 years before they were able to come back and rebuild Israel again. During that time, there was a prophet by the name of Daniel. Daniel lived almost his entire life in exile in Babylon, which is in the east. We know so much about Daniel, and, and one of the things that's important to know is that most of what we know about the Messiah, a lot of the prophecies about Jesus come from the book of Daniel. So here's what a lot of scholars think, and I agree with this too, that a lot of the people that were the Magi were actually a remnant of the believers from where Daniel was in Babylon. And over 400 years, they carried down these traditions. So when they saw the star in the east, they wanted to travel to see, there's now a new king in Israel, and this was a big deal. Now, why do I tell you all that? Don't you find it interesting that the Jewish people who were waiting for the Messiah, who were looking for it, who were hoping for it, missed it. And a bunch of pagan people from Far East had to come and tell them, hey, by the way, guess what happened? The king just came. Why do I tell you that? When I look at our church today, I see a lot of people in our world who are not followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to say this, and it might hurt. They do a lot better job of remembering Christmas than we do. And I think that's the point, the point that Matthew's trying to make here. Listen, church. This is the whole point. Jesus came, and if we're not paying attention, we are going to miss it. And that's why they came to King Herod, because Herod was allegedly the king of the Jews. And they thought, oh, this must make sense, because this must be where this new king was born. But we look at verse 3. <laughs> when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Can I help you with something? The reason why Jerusalem was disturbed was because Herod was disturbed. He was not a very nice guy. He knew that this was not a good thing. This was not just some random group of travelers that showed up. This is a vast group of people who came and said, we're here to worship. We've seen the sign. We realize the Messiah has come. And Herod was not happy about that. Which might seem kind of foreign because like, okay, wait a minute. Isn't he the leader? Isn't this what they're supposed to do? Isn't this a great moment for Herod? But remember, Herod had a disturbed heart. And how do we know that Herod had a disturbed heart? Because there was only room for one king in his heart. What did I just get done sharing with you before? Every time there was a threat to his power, what did he do? He was so insecure, he killed him. He got rid of it, he was done. There's only room for one king in his heart. And, and I'm going to say something that might kind of hurt church. It's still true today. <laughs> There's only room for one king in your life. And you've heard me say this all the time. We either say to God, thy will be done, or we say to God, my will be done. And it's the same today, and that's what Herod was saying. Herod had a heart problem. He had a disturbed heart because there was only room for one king in his heart. So when these magi showed up from the east, he's like, uh-oh, this is not good. So I want to ask you a question, church. How's the condition of your heart? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling disturbed? Are you feeling worried? Are you feeling a little annoyed? Or do you have peace? Do you have the peace of Jesus? Psalm 139, verse 23. And this is a fantastic prayer. Um, this is one of those you might want to write down and, and just pray to God over and over again. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How do we combat having a disturbed heart? I believe it's that prayer. All of us, if we're being honest, at times in our life, we're feeling like Herod did. We're feeling a little insecure. We're maybe feeling a little threatened. We're maybe feeling a little bit like, I need to stand up for myself. 
Where does that come from? It comes from a lack of peace, of knowing who you are in Christ, and knowing that God is the king. You may have heard this before. This is a really cool thing that somebody taught me a while ago. Um, it says, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. But the second thing is also true as well. To know Jesus is to know peace. Without Jesus, church, there's no peace. But once you know who Jesus is, there's a peace that passes all understanding. How are you doing with that heart? Do you have a disturbed heart today? And if you don't, I would contend maybe we need to know Jesus. Here's the second condition that Herod had, the heart condition that Herod had. He had a deceitful heart. Herod had a deceitful heart. Look at verse 4. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. Now, this verse actually gives us a very interesting insight into King Herod. And I don't want you to miss it. Every single Jewish boy and probably girl knew where the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. They all knew it. It was like the standard Sunday school answer. Everyone knew that. But did you miss it? Herod didn't know. <laughs> you know what that tells me? Herod didn't really know his scripture, did he? He didn't really take time to understand God's word. In fact, one could make the statement, and I think this is a pretty good case, Herod might actually be using his religious beliefs for political gain. He's telling the people, oh yes, I'm a, I'm a practicing Jew, but he's actually not. <laughs> he doesn't even know the most basic answer to the most basic question. That never happens today, does it? Do political leaders use the church for their own gain? <laughs> Sometimes. But here's what he's saying again. There's only room for one king in my heart. Why didn't Herod know that? Because he didn't think he needed to know scripture. He didn't think he needed to understand God's word or learn from that. He thought, I'm the king, I know best, I don't need to have any of that in my life. And I see the same thing today. And you've heard me say it so many times. Every single person has an authority by which they live by. You're either living by God's word or you're living by your word. Which one are you living by? That's what Herod did. Now, looking back on this too, I, I'll tell, just say this. If I was one of those priests, I would have proceeded with caution, right? <laughs> if King Herod were to say to me, where was Jesus to be born or the beside of born? I wouldn't just spit out, well, in Bethlehem, of course. Why didn't you know that? <laughs> because it probably would have been not so good for you at that point. If I would have been one of the priests, I might have said, wow, Herod, that's a great question. Oh, I can't think. Do you guys remember? Let, let's look and see. Let, let's dig in and let's find. Where's the answer to that question at, Herod? Because he, would, he didn't want to give the impression that Herod didn't know something because they were afraid of him. So Herod did what he did next in verse 7. Herod called the Magi secretly and found from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now I want to ask you a question. Why did he call him in secret? Because here's the thing, Herod had no intentions of worshiping the Messiah. He had every intention of going and killing the child. And the reason why he called him in secret is because everyone in his court would have known he is lying. And none of the Magi would have known that either. And if we're not careful, we can have a deceitful heart too. Now you might say, well, pastor, I would never kill a person. Well, let, let me tell you something. If we come to church here on Sunday, we lift our hands and worship and sing and praise to God. And then we go out and we speak ill against our fellow brother and sister. You know what Jesus says? If you speak ill against your brother or sister, it's the same thing as if you murdered them. And I've seen a lot of reputations be murdered by gossip and lies. And, and so we want to make sure we don't have a deceitful heart. Look at what Jesus says in Mark 7. And I think this applies to Herod. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Back in the first century when Jesus and Herod were alive, the big thing was the Greek theater. And uh, the Greeks did a great job with theater. One of the things that was a little bit different than today, if you're not familiar, is instead of having multiple actors playing multiple roles, they would really have one or maybe two people and they would wear different masks. And those one or two actors would actually perform the entire play for all the characters, and they would switch the mask out. Does anybody know what the actors in Greek theater were called? Hypocrites. That's where we get the word from hypocrite. 
Think about it. They wore different masks depending on where they were at and in the different situation. Think about this in life. When you're at work, are you a different person than you are at home? Are you a different person at church than you are in your private life? See, that's what the definition of hypocrite means. It didn't start out as a negative thing, but when Jesus said that there, he was saying, listen, we need to be who we are. And I'll bring it back to what I'm saying about the deceitful heart. We can't have a deceitful heart. We need to be who we're meant to be. When Herod told the Magi, oh, go tell, I want to go find the baby Jesus, go find him so I can come and worship him, he was being deceitful. He wasn't being honest with them. And so many times in life we get in trouble when we're not fully honest with ourselves or with other people. Now, I don't want to come down too hard because here's the thing. I think all of us would agree we want people to be honest with us. We, we all would say, I really want to be honest with people and I want people to be honest with me. So why do we struggle with deceit? And, and I'm, not, I'm not immune from it either. Well, I, I found this story and I thought this was kind of pointed to what we're saying here. There's a guy by the name of Gary Richmond and he wrote the book called View from the Zoo. And in this book, View from the Zoo, he tells a story of a raccoon. And we got a little picture here, just to make a visual here. I want to show you. This is a, look at this baby raccoon. Look at that. Oh, no. Look at that. Isn't that cute? What a cute little guy, right? So this is, what, this is what Gary Richmond says, though, about him. He said, at about two years of age, a baby raccoon goes through a glandular change, easy for me to say, and they can often change in their personality. Now, any parent would tell you, any two-year-old might do the same thing, right? People kind of do that too as well. But, <laughs> but apparently for a raccoon, they're a little cute and cuddly for about two years old. They get to about two years old, something changes, and they can actually flip on their owners. And this is what Richmond said. A 30-pound raccoon will be equal to a 100-pound dog in a fight. Not something you really want to mess with. So this is what he said. I felt compelled with this knowledge to mention this to my friend Julie who had a pet raccoon. She listened politely as I explained to her the coming danger. I'll never forget her response, and, and boy have I heard these words before myself. It'll be different with me. Then she added, my bandit would never hurt me. Richmond writes, three months later, Julie underwent plastic surgery for facial lacerations and she'll never look the same because bandit attacked her for no apparent reason. Now what's my point in saying that to you? I think the seat starts out as like a cute little baby raccoon. You know, it won't hurt anybody. It's not a big deal. It's, it's not really, th I can handle it. I'll, I'll take care of it. It, it. It'll be different for me. And it just grows and it can grow and it can grow. And anytime we're deceitful with ourselves or with someone else, it's gonna come back and it's gonna get us. And that's why church is so important for us to have godly people into our lives. Because the biggest person we can deceive <laughs> is ourself. And Herod was a victim of this too. That's why he was so delusional. He didn't have anybody who had the authority to speak into his life and tell him, say, Herod, you're not doing this right. And we all need to have that. I have something that I learned a while ago that I thought was really helpful. It's called the say it out loud test. This is what I mean by that. If I say it out loud to someone else, and they kind of give me that look of like, oh, I don't know about that. That's probably not a good thing to do, okay? Now, a lot of things sound, you ever had this happen before? A lot of things sound good in your head, right? Oh, it's not a big deal, I'll just do this. But if you say it out loud to someone else, and it still makes sense, it's probably a good thing to do, okay? Now, one of the things that I've done, especially lately, is I, I have people in my life who are very, I'm very open with. I'm like an open book to you. And there's two pastors in particular um, that I meet with on a consistent basis. They're not part of our church. And, and I just, I just, I expose everything to them. Like I'm just completely an open book to get them. Because here's the thing, church. As the pastor of this church, I want you to know I got a big bullseye on my, top, on my back. I'm not immune from deceit, just like anyone else would be in this room. And, and here's the thing. If Satan's going to come after this church, guess who's going to come after? The guy in this chair. And one of the things I've learned in my own life is I need to have people in my life who can speak truth in my life, who I can expose everything for and be open and vulnerable with so they can speak some things into my life. And, and, and most of the time, I don't like hearing it. <laughs> and, and a lot of times I could justify it and I can argue with them, but I know two things. I know they love Jesus and I know they love me. And if you don't have that in your life, church, you've got a baby raccoon. You need to find someone in your life who loves God, who loves you, who's willing to say, hey, 
can I just speak into your life on something? I, I, I'm seeing this, and I, I just need to ask this question. Because we don't want to have a deceitful heart. And, and the biggest person we deceive is ourselves. And Herod had that. So we don't want to have a deceitful heart. Here's the third thing we don't want to have. And Herod had this. Herod had a desperate heart. Herod had a desperate heart. Our hearts are always searching for something. We are always searching for acceptance, belonging, purpose, and value. And as we know, church, the only fulfillment we can find in life is in Jesus Christ. But yet, we spend our entire lives so desperately trying to fill it with anything else. How many times have I seen a couple join hands and pledge to live the rest of their lives together and no human being on planet earth would ever be able to talk them out of that yet how many times have i seen those exact same couples come apart and say i don't want to have anything to do with this person and i hate this person for the rest of my life how does that happen because we are trying to fill something that can only be filled by jesus we try to look for the one person in our lives and yet we have the one and it's jesus and if we try to make something or someone else God in our life, we will fail every time. Because again, there can only be one room for one king. There's only room for one king in my heart. And it's either thy will be done or my will be done. We have to decide, church. Well, um, the rest of Matthew chapter 2, I want you guys to read in life groups. Um, there's another part that I'm going to read here, but... But just to kind of fast forward for the sake of time, the Magi do go and they do find Jesus and they do worship him. And God warns them in a dream not to go back to Herod. He reveals Herod's plot so they don't go back and they leave and they go another way. And then God warns Joseph to take Mary and the baby Jesus and they flee to Egypt to escape Herod who's going to come after Jesus and try to kill him. In verse 16, it says, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. Why? Because he had a heart problem. And he gave the orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, according to the time which he had learned from the Magi. Why would Herod do that? Because a desperate heart is a hurtful heart. When you're looking for fulfillment in other places, you will use people for your own advantages, and you will see them as a means to an end instead of a person who Jesus loves. And that's what a desperate heart does. And verse 17, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice heard in Raman, weeping in great mourning. Rachel is weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, when you read that verse in the passage, it might not make a lot of sense. It's like, what, what is what's it talking about? What's going on there? Well, I want to share something with you that's really cool that, again, might give you a different perspective on this story. I mentioned this already. Matthew wrote his gospel to the Jewish people. He wrote them to say, our Messiah has come, and it's Jesus, and we can live and be part of this. And so what he's referencing here is something that um, I want you to understand, but I want to introduce it by saying this. The community of Bethlehem, throughout scripture, and again, every Jewish person would know this, the community of Bethlehem throughout scripture has been associated with death. What do I mean by that? You might wanna write down Genesis 35, and again, you can look at this in your life groups, but the first time Bethlehem is mentioned in scripture was in Genesis 35. There was a man by the name of Jacob who had a wife named Rachel. Jacob would eventually be the, the patriarch of the nation of Israel, and his sons would become the tribes of Israel. But Rachel, while she was giving birth to a son, actually died, and she was buried in Bethlehem. And when, as Rachel was dying in childbirth, she gave her son a name, ben which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob renamed him to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. That's, that's how Bethlehem gets introduced in the story. And again, all the Jewish people would have known that as well. Fast forward to, like I said, the exile, when the nation of Israel was conquered. Jeremiah was the prophet at that time. And making reference to this point with Rachel and, and with Jacob, he realized that at that point, which is Ramadan, which is actually Bethlehem, there were so many, uh, he watched a lot of the um, 
Jewish males be murdered before they were exiled. Many of them were killed and not taken to captivity. And he saw all these widows crying out. And he made the analogy of the mothers losing their children, just like Rachel lost her son and saying, son of my sorrow. And so when Matthew referred to this, again, every Jewish boy and girl would have known what he was talking about. And in fact, at this point, many of them might actually remember what King Herod did. Many of them probably lived through that. Maybe they had a sibling or a parent that had been killed during that time and they would remember that event. See, the community of Bethlehem throughout Scripture was always remembered for death. Now, why do I tell you that? I, it sounds kind of depressing, right? <laughs> now, can I give you some good news? You ready for some hope? Jesus came to flip the script. And, and here's the good news. And if I want to just sum up our entire series, what I'm going to be talking about the next month is here to understand our world is a fallen and broken place. There's lots of grinches, but Jesus came to flip the script. Because here's what I want you to understand. The community of Bethlehem is no longer known for a place of death. The community of Bethlehem is now throughout the world known for one thing. And literally millions of people travel to Bethlehem every single year for one purpose because it was the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Friends, we have a hope in Jesus Christ. And I don't know how your heart is. I don't know how Christmas has been for you. And again, if you're watching online, if you're struggling right now, I in no way want to downplay that. But I want to give you hope. <laughs> even though your world may seem hard, even though it might seem sorrowful, my Jesus can come and he can redeem that. And, and, and he can make the community of Bethlehem the place in your life where this can be the one thing that we're known for, is we're known for Jesus. And, and here's the part that I love most about this. Herod the Great, right? The great Roman governor, the great king of Judah, the great builder of the temple, the great builder of Messiah, the great conqueror of the first century. We know him for one thing. <laughs> He's a footnote in history. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? The only time we know King Herod's name, and the most reason why any of us know King Herod's name, is because when Jesus came, he was the king. And I just love that, church, because here's the thing. God will prevail in our lives and in our hearts. And the whole point of Christmas is to recognize that Jesus is here to save. So, as we wrap up, how's your heart? Let's look back at those three conditions. How's your heart today? Do you have a disturbed heart? Are you feeling anxious and worried? If you have, I would encourage you, if you haven't made the decision yet to follow Jesus and, and, and really claim that, we could do that today. And even tonight at our baptisms, if, if that's the place that you say, hey, I want to make that choice and I want to confirm that Jesus is the person in my life, we can do that. Do you feel like you have a deceitful heart? Are you filling your mind with God's word? Are you seeking godly counsel? Or are we relying on our own worldly wisdom? Am I one thing in private and a different face in public? And if that is the case, who is someone in our lives that can hold us accountable? That we can just be vulnerable with? Who loves God, who loves you, and can speak truth into our lives? So we don't deceive ourselves and let that little baby raccoon come and get us. Do you have a desperate heart? Are you continually seeking the next thing, the success in life, the, the, the boyfriend or the girlfriend or, or the, the good grades or whatever it might be? Because everything will fall short. Do you find yourself using people to get what you want or do you find yourself serving people so they can be successful at what God has called them to be? How's your heart, church? And at the end of the day, there's only room for one king. It's either going to be thy will or my will. Which one are we going to do? And just as that little town of Bethlehem was redeemed for my Savior, and now that's the only thing that Bethlehem is known for, I, my prayer is that this Christmas would be that for us. That we would reclaim Christmas as God's people and that we wouldn't miss Jesus. That we would remember who He is and what He's done for us. And that although the world might change and the world might cause struggles, at the end of the day, my Jesus is going to reign. He's going to rule over the earth. It doesn't matter the challenges you're facing. He can come and be part of that. God, I thank you so much that you came to that little town of Bethlehem 
all those years ago. And you created quite a stir. <laughs> Not only with King Herod, but it says all of Jerusalem with him. And God, I thank you for a group of people who are watching for you, who are waiting for you, who didn't miss your birth. And I thank you for the effort that they put in to, to coming to find you. And, and God, I pray that right now we would have that same heart, that we would want to seek you with all our hearts. We would travel distances if need be. And we would surrender our heart to you because there's only room for one in our heart. And Jesus, let's make that you. And once we can get to that point that we can share that love with others and they can recognize there's nothing good in me, but it's who you are. And our faithful love and service of you is how we can shine the light, not just during this Christmas season, Jesus, but throughout the rest of our lives. And that again, Christmas wouldn't just be a time that would come and pass and we would maybe breathe a sigh of relief when it's over, but rather Christmas would be every day. And we would love and serve you in all those things. God, I thank you and I praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.